Okay, so my name is Martin Helsbong. I work at uh, Factor 10. I'm a software engineer there, and we are based in Sweden. And uh, uh, it's awesome to be here at uh, Rustfest. Really? It's there, it's there, it's not there. So why not? And I also didn't start very quick time recording, right? So let's do that. So let's see if it starts now. I'm still Martin. Uh, where had I gotten to? Uh, yes. Um, so, awesome to be here at Rustfest. Um, I'm here to talk about QuickCheck, which, which is a test method that is uh, underappreciated, I think. And uh, the reason is that it helps you find bugs that uh, traditional testing often don't find. And there's been case studies that has been showing that um, you find more bugs with less effort per bug using QuickCheck. And that's, that's a nice promise for you. And um, traditional testing, um, it works by verifying expected behavior, and you, perhaps you poke around some of the expected edge cases. I haven't changed my slide, no? So the, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed at, to be at. No? It's just that I have a long intro and uh, you know, setting you up for all kinds of failure. Anyway, um, and now you lost me. But anyway, yeah, you, you, you poke around ed, uh, expected edge cases. And uh, the reason for this is that uh, uh, th this isn't optimal, it's because uh, you write your own tests and you won't surprise yourself or your code, but uh, randomness actually will surprise you and your code. So that's why a quick check uses randomness to uh, uh, generate hundreds or thousands or like any number of test cases you want according to your specifications. and. Uh, uh, this gives, randomness gives QuickCheck the power to generate very varied test cases. Um, as an example, uh, there was a bug filed against Google's level DB that um, needed, they hadn't found it, Google hadn't found it with their traditional tests, but that was because it needed a sequence of 17 API calls to trigger the consistency bug. And uh, QuickCheck found this by someone writing a test for QuickCheck that explored the API and looked for inconsistencies and using randomness to guide it. And uh, uh, we can all agree, I think, that no one writes a standard unit test that is that long. Um, so my ambition with this talk is, is to get you excited about using this in your projects, and I'm not going to be very Rust specific. Uh, so most of what I'm saying is applicable to quick check and randomized testing in general. So you should be able to take something back to your projects. Okay, quick check. There's variants available for most languages now, uh, but it originated in the Haskell research community about uh, 1999, work from uh, Cohen Clayson and John Hughes. And John Hughes, if you remember, is uh, the author of the classic paper, Why Functional Programming Matters. So uh, they know what they're talking about, I guess. Uh, and this is how it works. Quick check. You need to make a testable statement about your code. Um, for example, you, you say that you have written an absolutely amazing summation function. And uh, 
you can make a statement about that saying something like, my summation function takes a list of integers and returns a positive integer, always. And at the traditional test method, it's like you're a coworker, an intern, junior coworker that just goes, yeah, well, it sounds like, uh, sounds like, uh, sounds, sounds like it's working, uh, because I just did one test and it worked. But quick check it more like you're a know-it-all coworker, the best of visa, that um, he won't take your word for it. Uh, we'll run hundreds of test cases to see if your statement actually works. So it looks at the signature of your statement, generates lots of test cases, tries to find a counterexample. And if it does, or rather if it doesn't, approves of it, and if it does find any, it hands you the test case it used to prove you wrong. And this is how it could look in, uh, in code. The summation function just takes a list of integers and returns an integer. It's so awesome that I didn't even include in implementation. Uh, then you have your statement, which is something like a function that says sum is always positive, that takes another list of numbers and returns a boolean. And uh, then you have quick check, test it out for you. And it will uh, generate a lot of vex with different numbers in it and see if it always succeeds, returns true all the time. And in this case, probably what will happen is that it will say something like, sum is always positive, it failed when given the example, the counter example is the list of the number minus one. Because, oh, okay, I, if I sum a negative number, obviously it won't be positive. So that's quick check helping you with finding a discrepancy between your code and your statement. Perhaps in this case, the summation function should have, uh, have had unsigned integers, or your uh, assumption about the, how it worked is wrong, so you should find a different statement. Uh, how does it know how to generate test cases? Well, for primitives, these uh, functions are built in. Uh, if you have your own types, uh, you, have, you write a custom generator. It's not that hard. And you can, uh, if you write a custom generator, then QuickCheck automatically knows how to generate a list of such instances. If it finds a counterexample, QuickCheck does something called shrinking to minimize the test case. Uh, you can also provide a custom shrinker for your types, but that's Seldom necessary, but the possibility is there. Uh, if I make you uh, excited about QuickCheck and you want to use it in your projects, you will face some criticisms. Uh, this is mainly because QuickCheck now introduces randomness into your builds. And uh, people will say stuff like, we don't want unstable tests. We must know who broke the build. What change did they do to make it fail? What if it passes QA and then fails the release build without any changes? And I mean, that's, that's valid criticism. Some processes doesn't handle randomness and non-determinism very well. And on the level of an individual developer, I mean, uh, you do a big bug fix and the test passed. Is it now fixed? Or uh, is it just because a failure case wasn't generated? Or the opposite, you add a feature and the test failed now? Was that by chance? Or did a failure case just happen to be generated? All valid criticisms. However, in practice, it's often much more stable than you would think when you hear randomness. It's not like it's flip-flops 50% of the time it fails and 50% of the time it's... Uh, it works because you generate hundreds of test cases. Well, if you have some case that is only generated once in every like 200 test cases and you generate 100, then perhaps it flops uh, and flips between. But uh, otherwise, uh, it mostly in my experience, are they always fail or they always pass. So very, very, very unlikely cases, they, they are problematic. Uh, but we must remember that 
the criticism that we now introduce unstable tests, that's not really true. Because an unstable test is something with the same input gives two different results. And you don't know why. But the unlikely case, it happens, and then you get a counterexample that when given this, it always returns this failure. Uh, so you need to take good care of the counterexample, and uh, you can use it to write a traditional unit test. And you can also tweak a generator. If you have a generator for your type, you can tweak that to generate the edge cases more often, so it's not that unlikely anymore to generate that case. Uh, on the process level, we could look at fixing the seed to the random number generator. However, that trades uh, test coverage for stability, which is not perhaps a good trade-off. Depends on if you want to find bugs or you want your build to always work. Um, you could also give up to these criticisms and, and say something like that we, we don't run it quick check tests in the standard build. Perhaps you in, instead uh, need traditional tests, and you uh, could do a bug hunt running in nightly just to see if you could flush out some bugs at that point. So you could also th then see it as a feature, not a bug. Because uh, if you have a method to find more bugs, isn't that very, very, very valuable? OK, it could cause some problems with uh, depending on the processes you are trying to embed quick check in, but there's a trade-off you need to make. So now uh, we can look at how I used quick check. So in my project, it's kind of a microcontroller project. I, I really like how the previous talks have uh, geared into this, because uh, it's very much helpful to have a couple of concepts explained. It's kind of a microcontroller project. I do it on my uh, experimental time, so I get paid, but the company doesn't. Uh, so I try to use Rust, and I try to say that I could do something like blinking the Christmas lights. But thinking about that, it wasn't that funny to, not that exciting to, to blink Christmas lights. I want to do something more outrageous. I mean, why if I can control a spaceship instead? OK, but those kinds of clients aren't right knocking our door, down, or our door down. So I probably need to make a simulated world with a spaceship with a simulated microcontroller. So, uh, and then I knew what kind of CPU I wanted on that. And I can see, see if you can guess which one it is. Uh, this is the classic uh, first version of the Macintosh the Atari ST, and the Commodore Amiga 500. Uh, this was the first computer I owned, Amiga. So for nostalgic reasons, I, I chose the processor running in all these three machines, the Motorola 68000. Uh, it's also it's almost 40 years old, the computers, so, uh, or the processor, rather. Uh, so uh, it's possible to emulate that their normal speech with something like 8 megahertz. OK, so now, it's, in reality, we have a simulated microcontroller project. Uh, I emulate a Motorola 68000 CPU, which is often called M68K. Uh, I took an existing C library called Musashi, running in the MAME, the arcade game emulators, uh, written in C. I wanted to port that to Rust. Uh, and I decided to do this rather recklessly as the project right after Hello World. And it's called the R68K, and it's up at, at GitHub. It doesn't really, it isn't fully functional yet, but it's useful for me. And uh, if you look at an M68K emulator, what you need to test this? Well, it's only 56 instructions in the CPU. So possibly you could just write 56 unit tests. However, that doesn't really work, because it's a combinatoric explosion of instruction, data size, registers, and addressing modes. And you can easily come up with 10 tests just for one single opcode. And there's 54,000 valid opcodes, and about 
uh, 11,000, not, not valid. I think it happened on automatic transition, which isn't good. Anyway, um, so a lot, I knew then that I needed quick check because I couldn't possibly write enough tests. So how did I use it? I basically made a statement that said these two CPUs, the Musashi and R68K, they should behave identically. And by identically, I mean something like, given random initial state, execute one instruction, verify that the resulting state is identical, and its verifying state is checking the contents of registers and memory, as well as verifying that the all memory accesses are a correct size and alignment and whatnot. And then I told QuickCheck, go ahead and disprove me on this. Uh, and it did, uh, repeatedly, remorselessly, kind of annoying, but ultimately helpful. But, uh, sorry about that. Anyway, results. So I ended up with something like 1,600 QuickCheck tests. Uh, one test is testing one particular combination of register and memory access variation and so on. And it uh, covers all the possible cases, hundreds of trials each. Uh, running all the tests single-threadedly is something like three hours, 45 minutes. So, uh, and Musashi is single-threaded, so I can't run parallel. Uh, which used, I then used GNU parallel to run cargo in parallel the tests with one test per instance. Anyway, I also ended up doing uh, 16 PRs against Musashi, um, because not all errors discovered by QuickCheck were my fault. Mostly the PRs, uh, to be fair to Musashi, was uh, something ir small, irrelevant things like uh, cycle counts, how many instruction cycles it took for, uh, for a single instruction to run. And I had a single complex statement about the identical behavior. I uh, then also learned that you don't need to have a perfect comparison. The statement was much simpler in the beginning, just tested register state, for example. It was still very, very useful to get something up. And then as soon as you take your statement and improve it, it will uh, automatically improve all these 1,600 tests. Now you run a more thorough comparison. So I'm very happy to say that it's verified with QuickCheck. I'm basically 100% sure that it behaves exactly as Musashi for all the instructions. I still have work to do uh, for uh, exceptions and stuff, but it still provides me a, a huge value. And I've written a couple of unit tests, standard unit tests, but 99.9% .9 are QuickCheck tests. Okay, so look at, let's look at the bigger picture. Uh, not talking about my project anymore. I could talk about that for hours, but uh, you have to catch me tomorrow. Um, so, we could here look at some, uh, a statement. How, what is a problem with the statement? Uh, it's uh, hard to, when you start using QuickCheck, it's hard to come up with different kinds of statements because you normally write a unit test that says, if I input 42, I should get three and a half back. But saying something for any number that holds for your code is not, it's not that useful. Uh, it's hard. So, okay, so now I get to the fact part. And the fact part is just saying something about your code. Um, there's basically, if I back up a little bit, there's three thing, different things about statements. The facts, there's inverse functions, and there's uh, comparing with a known good one. Facts we've already seen with summation one, stated something about that summation function. Inverse is something like uh, encode-decode pairs. You encrypt something and you then decrypt it. It should return the same value. That's a useful quick check property. If you compare something with known good, one thing is uh, that you can use the unoptimized version of your code. If you have an application and it had a very nice implementation of something, but it was slow, but it worked, 
Then if you need to do a you know, hairy performance hack, you can have a quick check run against your standard non-optimized case and run it against, compare against the, the optimized case. Your application with caching, without caching, for example. Uh, the idealistic model, this is how uh, the tests run against the level DB was done. The guy who basically wrote a idealistic model of a database with capabilities of insert and update and so on, and ran that together with level DB and just checked that it, they matched all the time. The idealistic model is much simpler. I mean, it could be a run, uh, in memory implementation. You don't need to make all the guarantees that you have for the actual model. You can also take existing code. Uh, that's the third one. And you, the, one of them is third party, uh, which is what I was using. I was using Musashi. Uh, or you can have the old version of the, your code. If you have version one that does something interesting and you want to do a re-implementation of that and you want it to be as good as the old one, you can compare version one and version two. So I have skipped one thing, is, and that's uh, what happens if you have irrelevant cases and you, you want to discard those when you're testing. Uh, it's also an example of an inverse assemble that's an, the inverse of this assemble. Thank you for mentioning this. Uh, so now you have to return a test result. And what you do is you have a function disassemble that takes an opcode, which is basically a 16 bits. If you disassemble it, you should have assembled text back, but not all opcodes are valid. So if they are not valid, disassemble will return an error. You don't care really what error, but you say now. Don't bother doing this test now, because it's not valid, because I can't assemble that, that result. But if it happened to be valid, I get some assembly text. Could be something like word size add of data register 3 to wherever address register 2 points. And uh, in code, uh, we test if, if you assemble this text. Do you get the same opcode back that you started with? And then you ask, you create a test result from that. So uh, this means that it tests all the places where disassemble works. Assemble should work as well. They're symmetrical, inverse of each other. I also want to mention uh, other places where QuickCheck is used on crates.io. Um, we have the regis crate, the byte order crate, iter tools, nalgebra diff, petgraph, conv, and diesel, for example, and hundreds, I think it was 107 when I checked. And uh, they all use QuickCheck. Uh, regex uses it to test UTF-8 encode, decode. Byte order crate uses it to test buffer read write. Both of these are examples of the inverse testing. Uh, Ether tools tests facts about its functions. Uh, in the wider industry, without talking about Rust at all, uh, Basho is using it to test RIAC. Ericsson uses it to find race conditions in uh, Erlang Amnesia database and their 4G base stations. Volvo Car had an interesting project where they uh, tested integration. They buy stuff from suppliers, put them in their cars. They're supposed to talk in a specific way. But uh, they found bugs in their, their communication, and they found, also found inconsistencies in the AutoSAR standard itself. There's more case studies at qvic.com. One of the original founders founded this company. They provide commercial services for QuickCheck. I have one last story. It's the level DB one. It was more, even more absurd than the one I said. He found that this, this, there's a talk of, about this, Lambda Jam 2013. A guy called Joe Norton, he uh, wrote a quick check test, found this 17-step sequence that failed. 
Google provided a fix. He ran the same quick check test. It now, after a couple of minutes, found a 33-step sequence that produced the same inconsistency. And I think we can agree that it is more or less impossible to write a unit test in advance that would catch something like that. So, the takeaway is, you won't surprise yourself, randomness will, stop worrying, and learn to love the determinism. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Martin. Um, next up, we have a great German tradition of Kaffee Kuchen, which is uh, cake and coffee. Um, that will last for roughly 20 minutes, I believe, or so. Um, maybe a little bit longer, um, and then we will come back uh, 